The next thing we're going to talk about in our background refresher on memory corruption topics is the various sections that are located inside of a compiled program and how those map into a process's virtual address space. So a compiled program has a number of segments, sometimes called sections. I tend to call them sections. Um, and they are logical blocks with inside a compiled program that help us to organize the contents of a program. Right? When you're writing code, you'll have a number of instructions, you'll have variables, some of your variables might be initialized to certain values, some of your variables will be uninitialized, you'll have global variables, you'll have local variables. And when we're compiling a program with the knowledge that it will eventually be loaded into a virtual address space, we'd like to take those various components inside your program and split them up logically inside of the compiled program. So uh, the three sort of main sections that you'll see in most programs uh, tend to be these. There's dot text. So that section within your compiled program will hold all of the instructions. Instructions meaning basically lines of code, right? So this is where you would see, you know, addition of two variables or calling a function or something like that. That's what lives inside text. Data holds initialized global variables. So if you said at the top of a program, you know, int x equals five or something like that, um, a memory region would be defined that has the value five associated to it um, across four bytes because it's an integer. And if you created uninitialized global variables where you just said int x instead of int x equals five, so uh, you know just int x semicolon, those uninitialized variables would all kind of be grouped together and put in dot bss. It makes like um, you know operations like zeroing them all out really easy if they're all in one contiguous memory chunk together. There are a lot more segments to typical applications. We will see that in a little bit when we examine that um, simple program we looked at last time. When a program gets loaded uh, and turns into a process, you know, from last time we spawn a child process, we create a virtual address space for that child. So this diagram shows the typical Linux virtual address space for a 32-bit application. A 64-bit application looks essentially the same, like the components of this are in the same place. Um, it's just that we have more memory and there might be more spacing between components. Okay? But up at the high order memory addresses, so like imagine this line up at the top of the diagram being memory address 0x FFFFFFF, which would be the largest number we could represent in 32 bits. From there down to about here is an area of memory that's allocated for the kernel's use. So this is where your kernel code lives, all of the drivers that it needs, the, the scheduler, like just all the portions of the kernel live up here. And your user mode programs can't read from or write to this address, otherwise you'll create some sort of a fault within the program because you're not supposed to be able to modify or access kernel stuff. Um, you access this through the interface that we call system calls. And hopefully that's recap from your operating systems course. The next thing, if we're progressing from high memory addresses down to low memory addresses that we see in a virtual address space is the processes stack. Okay, so this is a stack type data structure that the process uses for managing functions and variables, uh, which we will get into later, but that's what lives here. The bottom of the stack, sort of as opposed to the way we typically draw it, um, the bottom of the stack actually is here at a higher address, and as we push elements onto the stack, the stack grows downwards to lower towards lower memory addresses. So this line right here is actually the top of the stack. Okay. After the stack, we have a region of memory where we put dynamically loaded libraries. Um, so if your program imports standard lib, standard io, string.h, whatever, any kind of third-party library that's required for the execution of your program, meaning code that you didn't write, lives here. It lives sort of in this middle region. And again, we will be vi revisiting this at some later date. The next thing we see in the address space is the heap. The heap is where we draw dynamically allocated memory from. So for example, if you call malloc and you allocate some number of bytes to maybe a dynamically generated string, those bytes, um, those memory addresses that you've been given all live in the heap. The heap kind of is opposite of the stack in that the low memory address uh, is the bottom of the heap and it grows upwards. After the heap is where we have the components that would have been loaded in from your compiled executable or the program that you're running. 
So up here we have the BSS segment, followed by the data segment, followed by the text segments, all of your instructions. Okay? And that's generally the organization of a process's virtual address space. So what we're going to look at next is a short demo where we look at these sections inside of our compiled simple example. And then we're going to load that example into the GNU debugger or GDB and step through it um, just so that we can see some of these sections um, in memory. So we can try to identify where they're laid out, for example, in that process's virtual address space. So in this demo, we're going to start out with looking at the sections inside of our compiled simple example from earlier. Again, just to recap, this program just takes um, a user's name, um, a number, and it calculates the Fibonacci numbers up to that number. So there's some recursion going on um, and things like that. So if we look at simple.out uh, that's already been compiled, we should see what sections are inside there. So there's a, a handy command called read elf, and we can say show me the sections for simple.out. Okay. It's going to draw a ton of content to the screen. Um, you can see here like this right here are the section names, um, this sort of second field. And you can see there's a lot more than just the three or four that were mentioned in the slides. Um, and their purpose isn't necessarily important at this point. I just wanted to show you the ones that we talked about that are in here. So section 14 is the text section. That's where all the code and instructions from your program goes. Um, this field here is actually the size of that section. So we can see that text is 317 bytes long. Okay. Another interesting one is number 16, RO data or read only data. This is typically where um, default strings and things like that go because we don't tend to modify like prompt strings and things like that that are printed as part of printf. Uh, we can also see the data section down here in section 24. It's only eight bytes, uh, meaning we probably don't have a ton of global variables. Uh, and BSS is right here with only four bytes allocated to it. And like I said, there's a lot of other sections. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is load our single, simple program into the GNU debugger and sort of set a breakpoint and execute so that we can see those sections mapped into memory. Okay, so I'm going to say GDB, um, start in quiet mode. Uh, so we can, you know, our program is loaded up here. Um, you know, here's the code for our main function, things like that. Um, so I'm just going to set a breakpoint in main. Okay. And we can now execute the program by saying run. Okay. At this point uh, in our program, uh, it will have been loaded into memory. All the, the sections and things like that would have been mapped into memory. The only thing that you can't see initially is the heap. I'll show you what I mean. One of the commands we can use in GDB is info proc for process mappings. This shows us or gives us information about the various memory mapped regions of the program. Okay. So the first column is the starting address and then the ending address of the memory region assigned, um, how big that region is, and then the thing that's sort of occupied or been mapped into that region of memory. So we see here there's three areas, there's three regions that have been mapped from the actual executable. Then there's a whole ton of stuff that if you recall from our diagram of a virtual address space, all of this would live sort of in the middle of memory. It's in that area that we would reserve for um, memory, memory mapped or imported functions. All right, so this is all the stuff that I'm pulling in from like the standard C library, for example. And then all the way down here at the highest order memory addresses inside of what's available to me is the stack for my program. What we don't see is the heap and the heap should live between somewhere between here and here. Uh, we can see the heap if we progress through the program a little bit further until we dynamically allocate some memory. So if you recall the way this program worked, after we got the user's name and stuff like that and asked them for a number, we dynamically allocated an array to hold um, the results of calculating the Fibonacci function. So if we move to right after this function call to malloc, 
we will have used up some dynamically allocated memory and then we should be able to see it in the process mappings. Okay, so if I disassemble main again, we can look for the call to malloc. Mm -hmm. Which is up here a little bit. Here it is right there. So we want to um, halt execution at the next instruction. So after we've allocated some memory, okay. Um, I'll just, to be safe, I'll do it a few uh, instructions later, like this one right here. So we want to set a new breakpoint, and to set a breakpoint at a specific memory address, you have to put an asterisk, and then the memory address. I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to continue the program, uh, continue execution until the next breakpoint. So remember, it's going to prompt me for a name and a number, and then eventually we're going to hit that breakpoint again. Oh. Okay, so we've uh, read the name, we've printed the name, we've asked for a number, and we've now just dynamically allocated an array uh, to hold the Fibonacci elements uh, for up, like, you know, element one up to five. So if we run info proc mappings again, now we can see um, a region's been defined for the heap since we've started dynamically allocating memory. So again, we have probably our text data and BSS sections, then we have the heap, we have all of the memory mapped libraries that we're using, like standard lib and stuff, and then we have the stack. So those are all the components of our, our executing process. It doesn't tell you which of the three primary sections, like text, data, BSS, RO data, stuff like that, um, lives here, but some of it we can infer. Uh, if we have a look, for example, this was the disassembly dump for the main function. Look at this memory address. This is the address of this instruction. So if we take this address and we look at the starting and ending addresses, we can see that this one, uh, we'll just look at the last four digits, 6325, lives somewhere in this range right here, right? Five uh, up to eight, so 6325 would be somewhere in here. So this is probably the text section of my program. We could also look at where certain variables are being pulled from, and that would probably let us know um, which of these ones is like data or RO data, but these are probably gonna be the various data regions uh, associated with my process.